Hello, everybody. Hello. I am uh, Keith Knight, gentleman cartoonist, and uh, welcome to SPX. Uh, um, really psyched um, to be a part of this because I missed it last year because of the hurricane that came through. Uh, one of two hurricanes that came through in North Carolina. So, um, but uh, our scheduled hurricane was two weeks earlier this year. So, um, I'm happy to be here. So. Um, what I meant to do is actually do a slideshow on uh, my new slideshow on racial literacy. But uh, since I scheduled this, a lot of things have happened since then. And so I sort of, it, it turned into a retrospective because uh, two things that happened is one, I got a Hulu show. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about it, but um, so I wanted to give you a little inside baseball on that. But also, um, I quit my daily. Today is the last day of my daily. And uh, a lot of people are horrified. Some people think it's a joke, but um, that it's not real. But I actually did quit. And um, I'm still doing my weekly comic strips, but I won't be doing my daily comic strips. And for those who haven't seen it, I will show you the final comic strip that uh, I, I came up with, which I think is the greatest way to end the comic strip <laughs> that I've seen. So, um, so, and also, if you've seen my, uh, if you've seen it two years ago, you're gonna see uh, a lot of the same stuff. But it's super good and super powerful. And um, let's get into it now. Unfortunately, there is no monitor on stage, and instead of me turning around and reading the comics. As I sit up here, I'm going to run back there and look at the monitor there and read <laughs> comics and then come back up, OK? So let's, let's work with that together, shall we? Um, I'd also like to say that my aunt, my Aunt Yvonne, has driven down from Pennsylvania to come and check it out. <laughs> so you will remember this face here. There is a, a, a little gentleman cartoonist. This is before I was ye old gentleman cartoonist. Um, I, I grew up uh, drawing on the walls in my apartment and um, was always encouraged to do so <laughs> until I got to school. And then I would draw little dinosaurs. And, and I remember, even as a kindergarten um, student, like the teacher going, oh, look at this, look at this, which is encouraging for me, but discouraging to everybody else. So it's always, I think, you know, it's this double-edged sword, whether it's, you know, you're praising someone in particular, because everybody draws when they're little kids. And I think people stop drawing because they say, oh, this person's better, but everyone should still draw now, and because it's great therapy. Um, with what's going on today, I would be insane if I didn't have a cartoon to draw. So um, let's jump into it. Um, it's great, you guys. You You're going to hook me up? OK, but for now, let's, let's just jump into it right now. Um, it always amazes me the way that people react when they first enter my bedroom. Holy smokes, what the hell are you doing with that blow up doll? I don't usually draw backgrounds, but this is one of my favorite backgrounds. Uh, Folks are often surprised to find a Feel Me Up Wilbur doll in my bedroom, although I don't know why. Tickle Me Elmo may be the number one doll for America as a whole, but Feel Me Up Wilbur has been sounding like hotcakes in the black community. They come in quite handy, although not for the use the manufacturer had originally intended. Taxi, and he's thinking, black man equals stabbed in back. Off duty, off duty. But wait, look, black man plus white guy equals okie dokie. Get the hell in here, boys. You see, because five black men standing on a corner without Wilbur is a gang. But five black men standing on a corner with Wilbur is a basketball team with a coach. <laughs> They're banned in Boston, so I bought a few to send to my friends back east. Oh my god, look, it's Hootie and the Blowfish. So that's what I like to do. I like to take uh, something that happens in my life and then do a little twist on it, a little autobiographical, a little message stuff. And it wasn't always like this. Um, uh, my first comics were about food fights in the cafeteria. And then when I got to college, it was about drinking beer and stuff like that. It wasn't until I had my first black teacher. Now, I had, a black, I had one black teacher in grade school. But it was a substitute teacher. And 
it was like the perfect teacher for me because he would have a study class and he was an aspiring cartoonist. And so he would invite me up to his desk and I would draw doodle alongside him. And just because someone that looked like me was drawing cartoons and wanted to be a cartoonist, that said to me that I could do it. And I don't know if you saw this study, but <clears throat> if black students have one black teacher within the first 12 years of school, just one, uh, they're over 30% more likely to go to college. And so that's a huge thing. And, uh, but my first like, uh, official teacher, uh, black teacher, was in college. And um, he was an American literature teacher. And he um, gave us the writers, uh, the, the assigned writers to read. He gave us Richard Wright. He gave us Maya Angelou. He gave us James Baldwin. Um, he gave us um, even um, Martin Luther King. And when someone brought up, you know, like, why are you giving us all black writers? He said, I'm giving you all American writers. And that exploded my head. Like, that was like, because when you think about American writers, what do you think of? Mark Twain. Like, it's a very Eurocentric belief that American writers are white writers. So that changed my work. And I made it, I love the idea that he's working within the system, but he's working to subvert the system to, to send out this message. So it was very important for me to do, oh, look at that. You guys are rock stars. Um, <laughs> um, unless that's f just for you. Are you now? <laughs> he's got the good seat. Um, so it was very important for me to work. So my strip started to be uh, about what it's like to be a, a black male in America. And, um, and I've been sticking with it ever since. <laughs> and 50 years later, I got a TV show. No. Um, so these are some of the prints that I really love. I sell it at, at, you know, at a lot of shows. You've seen them before. But it's such a really f uh, an inspiration to kind of do the research and do these drawings and stuff. And this, I'm not that good of an artist, so I, I always have to figure out like who I can draw okay <laughs> before I actually make these up. And believe me, I can just show, I can have a whole slideshow of ones that didn't work out. <laughs> You'd be like, oh man, this guy sucks. Um, okay, so uh, I'll show you some more funny cartoons. Since time the not a year and a half ago, a lot of readers have been asking me this question. Has this once macho he master gone all soft now that I'm a married man? The answer is yes, I've gone all soft. Soft and supple. <laughs> it's true. The best thing about getting hitched is being able to use all your wife's girly products in the bathroom. Stuff I would be caught dead buying in public. Okay, let's see. We've got some anti-crab ointment, anal wart remover, and a peach melba loofah scrub. Shh, not so loud with the loofah scrub. <laughs> That's right, people. No more scrubbing the nether regions with lava soap for me. We've got rosemary and aloe, uh, aloe vera eucalyptus leaves infused with hibiscus shampoo, organic sea kelp and lamb semen exfoliating wash, and colloidal oatmeal and placenta enema. Honestly, y'all, using this stuff does make a difference. A lot of folks have been noticing, gee, your skin feels terrific. So I love the monitor here, but it doesn't have the little preview, so I don't know what's coming next. <laughs> but that's OK. That's OK. It still looks good. So um, in 1999, I was asked by uh, Africana.com, a uh, black website, to come up with another strip. They wanted something similar to the K Chronicles, but I didn't want to do that. I already did a, an autobiographical multi-panel strip. I wanted to do something that was single panel and from the news. So I came up with Think. And it's funny, the word, uh, the title Think, because um, after like 15 or 16 years of drawing this comic strip, I just realized that um, think is just night spelled backwards without the G, which, like, you know, it's not that I was smoking pot and staring at it or something, but <laughs> it's just really trippy that, that, that I came up with that. Anyway, this is the very first strip, Denny's, serving black since 1997, if signs told the truth, and... Uh, and what I like about Think is, is you, I'm able to take these 
short ideas that I can't flesh out into K Chronicles and just do these quick shots. So I'm going to run through these really fast. Your sister had the baby. It's a boy. The exact moment radical black activist Thomas X realized that, yes, indeed, he was an Uncle Tom. Come on. <laughs> a screening for women only? That's discrimination. I demand entry. Hey, Louise, we've got another snowflake wanting to get a pap smear. Send him in. <laughs> this just in. Police have just released a description of the alleged gunman who's been terrorizing the downtown area. Please don't let it be a black guy. Please don't let it be a Middle Eastern guy. Ha! They'll never catch me. <laughs> ah, the power of white privilege. The penis monologues with Will Chamberlain, Jimi Hendrix, and Milton Berle. How was it? Way, way too long. I did a lot of research on that one. <laughs> You're doing this because I'm black, aren't you? Oh, now see, why do you always have to play the race card? Oh, yes, the race card. The race card, what about black on black crime? I'm not racist, I have a black friend. Um, all of these things are things people say to avoid what is most likely the biggest problem that America has, which is its inability to acknowledge and, and face uh, its racial history. Um, this country was built on the backs of people that look like me. And it is dismissed in our history as this minor little thing that, you know, in my history books, it said that slave owners treated their slaves just like family. And, and I, like a paragraph about it. And honestly, like this discussion, this thing that we avoid, Everything that's going on today, we would com be completely like not surprised at all. And we would have done something about it if we would just acknowledge how this country was built and, and not make the same mistakes over and over and over again. Now, there's a reason why you know, there's a small segment of the population that actually wants this to happen. You know? and, and it's taught in, in real books about racial history. But for the most part, uh, America is really ignorant about it. So I started doing slideshows about it. And um, people say, oh, well, I mean, you're a cartoonist. How can you do such things? <laughs> you're supposed to just make people laugh. But that's not true. Comics have always been sort of the court jester of modern times is like we use humor, but we also use a lot of other things to address different issues and stuff. So, um, you know, our discussion on race generally goes like this. One night at Ye Olde Gallery opening, frankly, I don't care if a person is black, white, green, purple, or brown. Who the heck are all these green and purple folks white people are always talking about? The K Chronicles by Keith Knight. I'm sorry, I consider myself relatively open-minded, but I have to draw the line at purple people. I know this ain't PC, but purple people are nothing but barely civilized knuckle-draggers. Believe me, I know. I sat next to one in second grade. When I was growing up, a purple family moved in next door, and the whole neighborhood started to smell like Fig Newtons. And I swear this one guy was hired at my job just because he was, well, you know. I heard green folks have three nipples. I think I'd better be going. Me too. <laughs> be careful walking back to your car. The purple people might get you. So here's the deal, everybody. Um, unless Avatar is a documentary, <laughs> there are no blue people. There are no purple people. There are no green people. And um, one thing I notice is when I, <laughs> I can't use that joke at, uh, at a, you know, a big comic book convention because there are blue people and purple people. <laughs> but I can do it here. <laughs> like, we have to, uh, our discussions about race have to be couched in reality. And here's the thing, I understand it. Um, it makes people 
uh, feel awkward and nervous about it. And for some reason, like we as a society think it's not okay to feel awkward or nervous or anything. Like we have pills to make everything okay for everything. And that's really not healthy. It's okay to feel awkward and embarrassed and, and shy and stuff like that, you know? It's, a, it's, it's actually good to feel all those emotions. Um, you know, you don't want to OD on certain emotions, but I mean, this is the stuff that we have to, if, in order for us to move forward, we have to have those type of discussions. Okay, so 10 years ago, I made the biggest mistake in my career. I decided to launch a daily comic strip. In the worst year of the newspaper industries, uh, 2008 is when the whole thing collapsed. That's when the economy collapsed and all these newspapers started shutting down all across the country. And so, oh, what a perfect time to launch a comic strip. But I had, I had my first kid and I was freaking out and I was like, oh my goodness, guaranteed income. Um, it's not much. But I will, I, will, I will do it. I will, I will do this thing. And so I launched The Nightlife. And um, like I said, I wasn't, I wasn't in a lot of newspapers. The newspapers I were, I, uh, I, I opened up in a, an OK amount, but then they all started closing down. They all started shutting down. In fact, I had one city that literally, and back in the day when cities had at least two newspapers, some papers would just buy your comic strip and not run it, but just to prevent the other paper from getting it. I had one city do that, like that just bought my comic just to hold it so the other paper, and then like both papers went out of business. <laughs> so there you go. That's uh, pretty wacky. Anyway, uh, I'm going to show you uh, just a little bit uh, about the nightlife. And here's the thing about the nightlife, and this is what I love working about the three different um, the K Chronicles is like a diary strip, all right? And it's sort of, you know, I can be a little blue. It's like, it's like the cable television version of the nightlife. With the nightlife, what you're doing with the daily, and what's so interesting about it is people want to return to characters like every day. So I had to develop, instead of it being about me, me, me all the time, I had to develop the other characters. So I developed my wife's character, the Gunther character I developed. I made a whole new character out of Clovis. I had all these different tropes and situations that you want to put your, because um, you want to have these things that you return to. So I had one character being stopped by the police all the time, which is my favorite thing, because it's a very subtle, you know, callback to police brutality. And um, also, um, my wife, who's from Germany, like her, the way she messes up English idi idioms, um, you know, it was almost like another life's little victories. Because once I did it once, people started sending me all their uh, partners and spouses, you know, idioms that they mess up. And so that was sort of perpetuated this, this whole new series and everything. So it was really fun. But uh, I'll just read you a couple uh, K uh, nightlife strips. Do you think extraterrestrials are racist? Why do you ask? They never abduct people of color. It's easier to catch white people at night. <laughs> so I love this because this shows the intelligence of my readership. When I ran this strip, all these people started sending me um, <laughs> articles about the very first couple that were abducted by aliens in the United States. And it was a mixed race couple. <laughs> And so, yeah, so um, I got schooled on it, but I still argue that they got caught by the white wife because of the white wife. <laughs> okay, this one, uh, I got the most, um, my strip runs in San Diego, uh, well, it did, <laughs> today, it's the last day, San Diego, San Francisco, Philly, Washington, um, and this garnered the most letters I ever gotten for a strip. Vet mentoring. A guy in my unit smothered an IED, took one for the team. When I got home, I went to tell his loved ones what kind of sacrifice he made. Turns out he was gay. I was the first one to let his partner know what happened. I've shared things with soldiers that I'd never tell family and friends. War does that. Here was a guy who gave his life for his fellow soldiers, but wasn't allowed to share with us who was waiting for him back home. 
If we're not fighting for this soldier's freedom, then what are we fighting for? So after the strip ran, I started getting all these emails um, from people who read the strip. And a lot of them were based in San Diego, which is a pretty big military town. And they said, like, your strip changed my mind about don't ask, don't tell. Like, and in every cartoonist fantasy, like, we wish we could change people's <laughs> minds with our work. But literally, with the amount of emails I was getting, I, like, like, literally, that was happening. And so I was like just super amazingly psyched. And I remember I did another Sunday strip where um, just, I remember at the last minute, like this, this woman who was talking about uh, this person she was dating, or um, I just changed the gender from, you know, that she was dating a man to a woman. And I can't remember, someone wrote to me and said, like, you just broke, <laughs> you just, actually broke this barrier in comics and in, in, in mainstream comics uh, by having this couple, this gay couple in, in it. And, um, and I love to hear that type of stuff. I'm not doing it just to do it, uh, but if there's an opportunity to put uh, a person of color or a woman in, a, in, in some way, shape, or form that like you haven't seen it in the comics before, I'll, I'll do it. Like, and, and I love uh, the idea that people will actually see that and acknowledge that stuff. So, so uh, like I said, we're in D.C. Uh, the strip runs on Sunday Comic D.C. Uh, this ran in July of, uh, of whatever year it was. And um, this uh, is our last uh, decent president. And he's in the Oval Office. And on his desk is the Sunday Comics, OK? Um, that year, after that strip ran, in I think September or October, he uh, repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Now, I'm not saying I had anything to do with it, <laughs> but the evidence is right there. <laughs> Comics can change things. So, I'm just saying that. Um, so, yeah, so comics, I think, can change hearts and minds. So, um, uh, a few years ago, eh, like five or six years ago now, I was doing a strip about Ferguson, like about police brutality, and I was super frustrated. I saw this photo of this woman, and I, like I've been doing stuff about police brutality forever, and I was sit just sitting there going, I still can't believe I'm doing comics about this stuff. And it really, I thought to myself, you know what, I'm going to put a slideshow together, and I'm going to tour a slideshow about how this is nothing new, you know? Because a lot of people are saying, oh, just, this just started when Obama became president, or this or that, and this. It's like, no, this has been going on forever. I've been doing comics about it forever. And so this is, um, the slideshow was called They Shoot, uh, Shoot Black People, Don't They? And um, I basically collected all my police brutality cartoons, because every time I did the slideshow, they people would say, do you have a book with all those? And I, I said, no. So I, I put that together. But uh, these are some of my most effective ones. Um, Mr. White Police Officer, how many shots does it take for four white officers to defend themselves against one unarmed black male? A black male? Well, let's see. Blam, 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 blam. 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 So, you know, those uh, into cartooning, you know that when a character is looking at a watch, that means a lot of time is going by. Blam, 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 blam. Blam, 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 blam. 41, don't you think that was a little excessive? Listen, you people could avoid getting into these situations if you would just lighten up. So this is about Amadou Diallo, an African immigrant, who was shot 40, one times by four officers that were, said they were defending themselves. As Amadou Diallo was standing in the vestibule of his, of his apartment building, going for his wallet. And um, so when they went on trial, it went to the whitest uh, part of the state, which happens like in any other situation. I haven't heard of a trial moving unless it's 
officers and uh, a black victim. I've never heard any other, I, you know, maybe anybody else? Like the marathon, Boston Marathon bombers, like they could have moved that. For some reason they didn't move it, you know? Only when it's a black victim and it's police. So they moved it to uh, the whitest part of New York and they got off because they were defending themselves. So the point I was trying to make was, at what point does it go from defensive to offensive? That's, that's the thing, like at what point? So, um, and this is the firing range where police officers do target practice. How come all the targets are black? What do you mean, they're silhouettes, they're supposed to be black. I'm talking about the Afro and the FUBU logo across the <laughs> chest, well, I'll be. So, um, that's a basketball in the hand of the silhouette. It looks like a small watermelon, too, and it works either way. So, um, but I did this in 2008, and in about 2013 or 14, there was a black female soldier that wanted to do target practice at our local police station. They said, sure, you can come down and, and do it. So she goes to the gun range where the police officers practice. And as uh, for targets, they had pictures of black teenagers. And one of them was her brother. So black male teenagers. And when uh, the police captain was asked about it, the chief, he said, what we're doing is not illegal. Like that was his excuse. So people need to understand that police were slave patrols, like going way back there were people that would hi were hired to track down uh, uh, runaway slaves. And like all it is is a different iteration of it. It's called a different name. That's it. When the police officers went on strike in New York City to protest uh, de Blasio and, and um, him being sort of um, on the side of people being hassled by police brutality. They went on strike for, I think, one or two days. Crime did not go up at all. The only thing that went down was the money that New York uh, made from ticketing uh, people. Um, and that's what, like, all the, the, all the um, an analytics of, like, Ferguson and Baltimore and all this stuff that the government did, they basically said, like, police nickel and dime black and brown communities um, for everything. They have these laws that say, oh, okay, a broken taillight, you know, you don't have to stop them, but they choose to stop certain people and they get them into this jaywalking in Los Angeles. You know, they, they I've gotten yelled at for jaywalking. You know, I grew up in Boston, like, we never got, you know, you can run in the middle of the highway. <laughs> but like there's all these different things that police nickel and dime. And you can sit there and defend, you know, you can defend, oh, well, they're just following the law. But you know what? Slavery was legal once, all right? You know, apparently putting kids in cages is legal. It doesn't mean that it's right. So don't use the idea that law, oh, it's the law. So, I mean, it doesn't mean that it's right. And I, people know that. People know that. All right, so here's another one. You're probably wondering why I stopped you. This is the, the thing that I always do in the nightlife. Uh, since you're a regular, I wanted to give you this punch card. Every time I pull you over, you get a new punch. What happens after 10 punches? I go on paid desk duty for three months. So <laughs> there was, I've done so many versions of this where they, he gives out T-shirts, you know, like, um, you know, he officially adopts him. Uh, like, you know, there's like all these different things um, that I get to have fun with with this stuff. But uh, just to show you, this is um, down the street from where I lived in Los Angeles. This is the 10 freeway. And there's one of LA's finest uh, on top of a 65-year-old grandmother, a black gran grandmother who um, she was schizophrenic and she was trying to cross the 10 freeway. And he decided to keep her from doing that by throwing haymakers on her. Now what happens is, <clears throat> she was lucky enough 
that someone had a telephone that has a camera in it that is able to film this stuff, okay? The reason why this is happening so much is because everyone's walking around with a camera in their pocket. This has happened for the past 100 years, okay? But we're lucky enough, you know, <laughs> for black people that, like, people are recording this stuff and sending this stuff out. Now, unfortunately for white people, they have to see it every day now. And uh, a lot of people don't want to see it. But uh, I suggest that we keep our cameras on and showing this stuff every day. And I know people are going to say, well, it's just a few bad apples. Well, if it was just a few bad apples, it'd be really easy to get rid of them, OK? And uh, for those who stand on the sidelines as like, you know, supposed good cops who let this go, there, I mean, that's not a good cop to me. A good cop is the people that do turn these guys in. Now, their stuff is, their career is over, but I mean, that just goes to show you how screwed up it is, you know? If you're a really good cop, you get pushed out. So what drives me crazy is, they go on paid desk leave, and then if they are guilty of it, at best, they get fired. They can get a job. They never follow up on this stuff. They can get a job in the next county over. And what happens is her family sues LA County, and then we pay for it. Tax people pay for it. The, the taxes that we, you know. I suggested on a panel once that if the money came out of police pensions, this shit would stop right away. And, and I'm not saying just that guy, but the, the precinct that he came from, if it came out of all their pensions, then they would push him out. Then they would get rid of them. So I was sitting with a politician when I suggested this in Durham, North Carolina. And um, someone raised their hand and said, uh, Representative blah, 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 would you support a measure that would? <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever seen The Matrix, but this guy was like, <laughs> like avoiding this question. And it was amazing. But um, it, 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 it's true. Like the moment that they have to pay and not us is the moment this stuff stops. And um, so I just suggest uh, everybody leave here and like whenever you see a politician, just suggest that, you know? <laughs> Don't say it to a cop though, he'll kick your ass. <laughs> All right, so, uh, <laughs> so here's the thing, like black history um, is not a one month thing. And as long as we, we ghettoize black history into one month, of like five feel-good stories, we're never gonna move forward, okay? <clears throat> this country is inevitably linked to slavery, you know? And slavery existed beforehand, slavery exists now, but America supersized it and really and racialized it. And I, I don't, I don't, I think people really grasp, like, black people have been enslaved longer than they've been freed in this country. And, and this is a super young country. So when you think about it, like, uh, 1619, like, that, that just came out. So 1619, this is, you know, 2019. So that's 400 years, okay? So, um, two, like, 250 of those years, you know, people have been enslaved, okay? Now, <clears throat> I just want to say this. What could you build, what kind of business, what kind of country could you build if you had five generations of free labor? Think about that. Five generations of free labor. Right? 250 years, okay, and people don't understand when Lincoln freed the slaves, what do you think happened? Do you think like suddenly white people were like, oh, this thing that has been around for generations, like suddenly I'm going to treat you like a human being. 
I'm going to give you a job. I'm going to have you pay. I want you to live right next to me. I want you to, black people were valuable to white people until they, you know, were freed. And then it was like, oh my God, like, this is terrible. This is horrible. And you know how many years Reconstruction lasted? 10 years. And after 10 years, they said, oh, you know, this is uh, 10 years after 250. This is perfect. Like, you know, does anyone have a pencil? Can I have that pencil? If someone can come up with a pencil faster, this guy's taking too long. <laughs> no, not that pencil. You know what? I did a technical school, and everybody, everybody had technical pencils, and so I couldn't do what I do. So I just want to say thank you for this pencil. So, <laughs> sorry. 250 years, and then after that, 100 years of Jim Crow, which is like, you know what Jim Crow is? This is like, oh, yeah, you're free, you know, but like there's all these laws, like if you don't have land, if you don't have this, you don't have that, you can't vote, you can't, we're not gonna give you equal justice. Here, uh, we get this water fountain, you get this bucket, uh, you can't live here, you have to live over here. Oh, uh, redlining this, that, like all these different things, okay? And then there's the civil rights movement. So there's, you know, 50 years of civil rights. Uh, what'd you say, like 40 years of affirmative action within that 50 years of civil rights, and then eight years of black president. So, 400 years, uh, or 350 years of oppression, and then you're trying to tell me like 40 or 50 years is gonna just wipe out generations of this? And the point I'm trying to make with the pencil is, is when you break something, no matter what it is, it takes way longer to fix something than it does to break something. What's going on right now is going to take decades to fix. Decades to fix. And people think in America that it's going to take, oh, uh, because we, uh, uh, a person of color gets hired in this place that has all white people, like that's going to fix it. And that's not going to fix it at all. It's not going to fix anything. All it does is make white people mad. OK? Uh, the, the talk of race only goes as far until uh, as white people get uncomfortable. And that's about 5.2 seconds. <laughs> white people need to understand that this is all a white space. When there's a diversity thing that comes into your job and, and, and you know, some white people go, but mostly people of color go. Like, I've heard people talk about these diversity things. The, pe the people of color can't speak on the shit that goes down in their jobs because the white people are there and could be like, oh, really? Is that what you think? <laughs> and, like, and, and like, it's not a safe space to, space to speak in. So these diversity things are a mess. The only thing we can do is be completely aware of the power that white people have in this community. And, and here's the thing. Five years ago, I would talk about white supremacy. I'd talk about white privilege. And people would look at me like, you're crazy. Like, I don't believe you're saying that. I don't have to do that anymore. If there's anything that is coming out of this, this generation, uh, this uh, administration, is like white people are seeing for the first time like what's been going on forever. So. It's extremely, to me, that's like actually a positive thing. So um, I've only got 10 minutes, so I'm going <laughs> to go through the rest of this stuff really fast. But I do this stuff at universities, churches, high schools, and all this different stuff. And, um, and people appreciate it. Um, but I'll just talk about my experience with, which resulted in, you know, as part of my TV show and stuff like that, which is uh, I was hanging up posters of my band in San Francisco. I've been living there for 10 years, and a cop car pulls up. A cop jumps out and says, what are you doing? I said, I'm hanging up posters. I said, I have a stapler, so I'm going to put it down. He gets on the 
phone, uh, the horn that says, hey, I have the suspect. And um, so I was like, what are, you, what are you talking about? And he said, oh, well, you fit the description of someone who's been robbing apartments in the neighborhood. I said, what's the description? He said, a six foot tall black male. And that's it. So then I looked down the street, a cop car's coming this way, look that way, cop car's coming, look up the street, cop car, car's coming this way. And I was like, oh my God, this is that moment that I've been writing about for all this time. Like, and I've always been from the outside looking in, just trying to you know, catch the eye of person going through it. And I was like, this is my opportunity to like, be in the middle of it and look on, from the inside out. And I'm like trying to catch the eyes of people going by and, I'm surprised at how scared people look <laughs> when they see me looking at them, you know, <laughs> like I'm surrounded by cops. But uh, my roommate, my white roommate was in a bus at the top of the hill and he's coming down and he sees all these cop cars and he says, um, oh wow, like there's a cop, a uh, bunch of cops hassling another black man. And here's the thing is I had all this hair, I had all these dreads. I looked like a sideshow, a black sideshow show bob. And um, so he immediately recognized me, and he was like, oh my god, that's my black man. <laughs> and the bus pulls up, and he gets off. And this guy is about this high. He gets up, off, and he comes running at the cops. And he's like across this big street, and he's like, get the, you know, he was swearing at me. He was going, get the hell away from him, blah, 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 blah. And all the cops, they all turn around. And it was like in slow motion. They turn around. They see this little guy coming at him going, get out. And they all turn around and they go, take it easy, buddy. Take it slow. And like I, I sat there and I was like, if he was black or he was brown, they would have pulled their guns on him. They would have pulled their batons. They would have beat the hell out of him and handcuffed him and dragged him away. That, to me, is the epitome of white privilege. And you guys move in a space. And the only, the only ones who kind of get it are women. Because women know that men can move in spaces that they can't move in after a certain time of day, you know? And it's like you don't understand it like it's like a fish in water like how's the water feel they're like what water like you've grown up around it and it's always been a part of you and I think it's a a, a, a disservice when teachers tell you that everything's equal everything oh race doesn't exist I do, you don't see color and that drives me more crazy than anything because if you don't see color if you say you don't see color, you don't see, you look right through me. You dismiss my experiences as just something that I'm making up or something like that. We should value our diversity and not just race, but in class, in religion, in culture, and all that stuff. It's super important. Okay, I'm sorry, enough with the serious stuff because I'm running out of time. And uh, I just wanted to go really quick to, um, so I moved to the South, and I was going to, I make a point about, you know, the South, people are horrified by it, but I've learned more about the black experience because I've moved to the South, and, um, and it, it's like a, it's, it's really weird, but, um, you know, I live, I live just outside of Chapel Hill, and to see the activism and pulling down these statues, and I don't know if you realize, these Confederate statues are a great metaphor for it all. They're like, they're like tin, made of tinfoil. They're like really weak, and you just never, if they come down super easily. It's like it's this whole sham. But um, when I visit places like Stavville Plantation, which had the largest um, uh, community of slaves like in the South for, um, in North Carolina, they built this agricultural building with no, um, no nails. And it's amazing that people uh, that looked like me endured what they had to endure and were able to learn and create all this stuff. Now, I mean, people don't realize, like, 
they don't want to want they, to tell you about how bad slavery was, but literally, I mean, you know, there are kids in here, but you could make your own slaves uh, by, you know, it, 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 we need to re um, rename what all this stuff was. So Thomas Jefferson with his mistress, it wasn't a mistress, it was sexual assault and she probably was like, I have no choice. I am, I am owned by him. I can't, you know, fight this thing. Like, all this stuff needs to be re renamed and not looked at, like, sugar-coated. And there's this one plantation, I guess, that a lot of white people are complaining about because they're starting, they're starting to tell the real history of the slaves there, and they're like, oh, I just wanted to bring my family out for a nice afternoon, and we have to hear about this darn slavery stuff. Anyway, um, moving to the South, I've learned more about the black experience in the four years I've been there than living the, whatever, 50 years I've been in California and Massachusetts. Um, blah, 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 this is another comic uh, hate thing, blah, blah, blah. Um, for everybody who thinks that athletes shouldn't talk, I, uh, shouldn't speak out, every, you know, then you're dismissing who this athlete is because he was, he was amazing with what he sacrificed and what he did. Um, we should all be speaking out. The problems that persist today are because people say, don't speak out, don't talk up. We should all be doing that. And it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be marching in the streets, but when you're at home at Thanksgiving and your racist uncle says something obnoxious, t you know, tell him to kiss your ass and they will think twice about saying, you know, they'll be mad, but they'll think twice about saying it again. And I mean, that's the thing. So people are saying, oh, you quit your daily. What else do you do? I do all these different other like freelance type things and um, a lot of neat other things that if you subscribe to my Patreon or uh, check out uh, my website, I'll post stuff about that, this stuff online. Um, Okay, really quickly, my TV show. This is uh, Steve Notley, <laughs> my buddy Steve, and me at a fake bus, uh, a fake San Francisco bus um, on the set of my pilot. Um, we shot it in Vancouver because we couldn't afford San Francisco. Um, this is Blake Anderson from Workaholics. Uh, he plays um, my roommate in it, and uh, Lamorne Morris from New Girl um, plays me. And so that's uh, my director, Mo, and Lamorne Morris and Blake uh, on the set there. And it was freezing out, and everyone had to take off all their jackets because it had to be California. And so it was kind of interesting. Um, uh, it's just really fun. I have to wrap up. I'm getting the wrap up sign. Um, just quickly, uh, all lives matter. Um, restrictions apply. See skin color for details. Um, <laughs> The last word on All Lives Matter, for all you All Lives Matter folks, listen. If you have a bumper sticker on your, um, on your car that says, save the rainforest, it doesn't mean F the other forests. It means the rainforests are being cut down and you're concerned about it. That's what Black Lives Matters is. So, um, yeah. And, oh, here's my very last strip for the nightlife. Oh, my God, Keith Knight, you really showed up. So this is a kid, like, through the Make-A-Wish Foundation wants to meet me. I'm here to grant your last request. Okay, here it is. Psst, 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 psst. She said she hates my strip and wants me to quit. <laughs> Come on, that's the greatest thing ever! That's the best! Oh, come on. All these people on Go Comics, like, is he, is that serious? Is he joking? Like, in Monday, they're going to freak out. It's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, uh, this is one last quote I want to leave you with. Listen, if you ever wondered what you would do if you were alive in the civil rights movement, now is the time to find out. Now, right now. And I'll just, I'll just end with this. Like, people will always sit there and say, oh, well, I'm not racist. Uh, um, I teach my kids not to be racist, so blah, 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 blah. Well, I did a strip about, like, you could say the same thing about littering. I don't litter. I teach my kids not to litter, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it still, does, it still doesn't mean that we 
how, we don't go to the beach and do a beach cleanup or go to the forest. And there are systems in place that are destroying the environment, dis that are littering our streets, destroying our water. And we can't just sit there on the sideline and go, well, I don't do it. Like, we have to collectively save, you know, what we thought was America, you know? And we have to do that, like, one person at a time. And so I, I say to you, as you leave here, to consider, like, calling people out on their stuff. Because here's the thing, the people that are, are uh, doing all this stuff, they are not counting on you to participate. Like, that's the thing. Like, the more you participate, the more uh, the uh, evil folks are freaked out, you know? There's a reason why so many people are being thrown off the voter rolls. It's because they don't want people to participate. There's a reason why, like, you know, public schools are being destroyed. They don't want us educated. So, to me, uh, it's sort of a, I, I, I'll do one more metaphor, the hip-hop reference, which is this. You notice how all the worst music is the most easily accessible? Like, you know the Taylor Swift songs, and you know all, but you know it because you have no choice. You hear it all the time. But you know if you go left down the dial is where you find the good music, or you find it like by digging in the crates, like, that's what you got to do with history, okay? So Christopher Columbus is like the Taylor Swift of history, <laughs> okay? If you pick up a Howard Zinn book and read the first 10 pages, you will find out the truth about Christopher Columbus and why he, it shouldn't be a holiday. We all have to dig in the crates. And I know everything is spoon fed to us and it should be that easy, but it shouldn't be that easy. We have to work for it. We have to work for it. It's the reason why you're here at SBX, to find the good comics, right? Because the crabbiest comics are the ones in the front of the store. And these indie comics are the ones that we seek out at places like S SBX. So I say to you, dig in the crates with everything you do and call people out on their stuff. And I thank you for coming here today. And